I have a bit of a competitiveness problem. Uh, for instance, story time. Um, my roommate in college, my senior uh, year, his brother came to visit us at our house. His brother was 13 at the time. He got sick from some sloppy Joe mix that our other roommate made. At that time, God bless his soul, you shouldn't eat, you shouldn't have eaten anything that that roommate prepares. Um, but anyways, little brother gets sick, so it's already not a good time. The three of us sit down to play Risk. I've never played before. My roommate is winning. Well, I can't stand it when someone else doesn't, when someone else wins, and so I'm going to do whatever it takes to win. And so I say to little brother, who's just gotten food poisoning, and he's coming back around, hey, we're not going to win unless you and I ally against your brother, and then we'll just be co-champions. Well, that was all a big fat lie, and he took it hook, line, and sinker. We allied, beat his brother, and then I crushed him for the win. I have a bit of a competitiveness problem. Anybody with me? I don't like to see other people succeed, if I'm to tell you the truth. Sure don't. When my ego is running rampant, man, I, I'm, in, I'm into trophy chasing. I want to be the best, and so I become in many ways the worst. <laughs> um, we went caving, me, him, me, my roommate, and not so little brother anymore the other day. We had a great time, and we, we recounted that story. It was awesome. Um, but this week, I, I got a glimpse of of something I haven't felt before. There's a person I've met in the community. Um, met him at Starbucks, not an advertisement. Get your coffee wherever you feel like it. Um, and I met him a couple years ago, and we start, We found we had a mutual interest in Frisbee golfing, and we started to go together. Well, I've beaten him every time we played. Not just beaten him, I've whooped him. But a strange thing happened this past week. He beat me fair and square, and he whooped me. This is true. We are going to get to that. I do generally, generally like to see other people succeed, not in games where we're competing, though. Um, but at, when we were Frisbee golfing, he beat me, and I felt this strange feeling. I was happy about it. Um, I was very happy. I had seen him go from not so good to better to beating me. And I, th I was excited about that. But also, we've started doing this thing we call Frisbee Church. We're on the front nine. We just check in with each other on the back end. Back nine, we just read uh, scripture verses together and discuss them. Um... He said he has no interest in coming to Sunday morning church anymore. And I said, okay, so it sounds like you're still interested in God, but you just don't want to do anything that's remotely traditional church anymore. So we've just started reading the Gospel of John on the back nine together. And I'm getting to watch him grow up in Frisbee golf, but also grow up in the good things of Christ. And it's such a delight. And I got a glimpse for a minute of what Christ feels about you and me what his delight is. It's hard for me to imagine the sinner I am that Christ has no ego in him whatsoever. None. He's completely secure in his identity as the beloved son of God. He doesn't need to hustle for his worth. I read a passage in John where he did this miracle, and he said he had it in his mind that these people were going to try to make him king now. But he retreated to a remote place because that's not what he needed or wanted. They liked what he did, but they wouldn't like what he now was going to ask them to do once he became Christ the king. He has no ego. He has no shame. Some of you out there are still struggling with this sense like you're not just, you don't feel bad about things you've done. You feel bad about you. Christ brings you into his presence where there's no ego or no, no shame. You're a beloved son, beloved daughter in whom God finds happiness. So Christ's delight 
is in you. His delight is in giving gifts to you. Give you gifts for the mission. We're going to talk about those in a minute. Particular gifts. Each of you a masterpiece. Like a woodworker. Carefully chiseling away and forming something. That's you with God, the woodworker. And Christ comes to give you the gifts, your unique gifts, for the mission. And his delight is to give you the Holy Spirit also so you grow up and mature in those gifts and join Christ in the heaven earth mission. That, he, that's what he gets excited about. Like I said, figuratively, it's what gets him up in the morning. And one more thing, he delights when you and me delight in our neighbor. We were in our small group and somebody said, hey, are we happy to have others be supporting characters in our story or are we going to delight in being supporting characters in the story of somebody else? We're in part three of the art of making a difference. That's the mission of our church. We want to make a lasting impact in our community by building relationships with all kinds of neighbors, by helping them experience freedom from their bur burdens, and helping them to know Jesus and practice his way. The art of making a difference starts week one with knowing the love of God. We can make a difference without knowing the love of God. Christians don't have the market on goodness cornered. But we're made to make a difference with the love of God. We talked about that triangle, love of God, love of neighbor, love of self. The kingdom of heaven is in the balance of those things. The second week, we talked about like acknowledging that we're part of something greater. It's a mission that started before us, it will go on after us. The humility of that is actually liberating. We're part of something greater in need of a, of a, of a greater power. I, I misspoke last week and said the, the first step of the 12 steps is the need for a greater power. It's actually step two. I was wrong. Step one is admitting that you're powerless. I messed that up. Step two is acknowledging the need for a higher power. Think about this. I, I thought about this building. Built in 1904. There are people's names on this stained glass. There are saints that came before us that I don't, I don't know their story yet. I would like to know. They came before us, and now we get to utilize this space as a base camp because of their faithfulness, and there will be a mission after us. Week one, week two, week three is about how all of us are masterpieces in Christ Jesus, the art of making a difference. The next step is seeing yourself as a masterpiece created for good works in Christ Jesus and seeing your neighbor as a masterpiece created for good works in Christ Jesus. The language in the New Testament is like God is, is building up a body with Christ at the head, all of us as bodies, as part of the body. Paul says in Corinthians, the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. The eye can't say to the ear, I don't need you. We're all growing up together in maturity as one body, carrying out the mission on earth. God's delight is seeing that happen. God doesn't want to do something on God's own. God wants to do it with us. And so, uh, I just want to read to you the next part of Ephesians. So, listen to this. We're going to expand on that just a little bit, and then i got some questions for you. Listen. Paul says, starting in Ephesians chapter 4, I'll reach back just a few verses. A few verses. Again, this is a letter to a group of people trying to follow Jesus in a time when it wasn't so easy. He says there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. To each one of us, to you, 
the person you don't like next to you. Grace, abundant grace, meaning love that a person doesn't necessarily deserve, but the giver is delighted to give and see the recipient grow up in. I'm skipping down to verse 11. It was he, Christ Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ, here it is, may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Good Lord, can I get an amen? How beautiful is that? Are you tired of being tossed back and forth by the waves? By every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Are you tired of that? Take your place in the body. Be strengthened in Christ, strengthened by your brothers and sisters and strengthen them mutually. The Holy Spirit tying it all together. A point of context and then questions for you. In Jesus' world, it was an honor and shame culture. You were either gathering up honor for yourself or you were seen as gathering up shame for yourself. It was a trophy-chasing world. I've told you, God's honest truth about me. I'm a trophy chaser when my ego's running rampant, when I'm not secure in my identity as a beloved son of God. I get tossed around by the wind. In Jesus' world, it was an honor and shame world. You were either gathering up honor for yourself, gathering up someday when you might get a statue to yourself, or you were seeing others with shame. It was a master and servant world. Everybody had a master unless you were Caesar. Do you think, do you think people delighted in seeing others succeed in that world? Not a chance. If anything, they delighted on stepping on somebody's back to get higher. Has anything changed? When I'm not grounded in Christ, nothing's changed in me. Nope. Nothing. And, and, And the disciples had spent three years with Jesus, and at the end, in Luke 22, they're arguing about who's, who's, who's the alpha dog. Go to chapter uh, 22 of Luke sometime and check it out. They're arguing about who's greatest. And Jesus overhears it. And he tells them just a little parable really quickly. He said, hey, if we, if we were to go to a dinner ba- banquet, would it be better to be like one of the masters sitting at a place of honor at the table, or would it be better to be a servant? At this point, they know how Jesus does things. They know he's going to flip the script a little bit. And... Um, They're like, okay, he's going to say it's better to be a servant, whatever. But he does say something they maybe did not expect. He says, I am among you as one who serves. I, the Lord of the universe, am on the earth in the flesh of the poverty class as a servant empowering you. He'll say it just a little later in Acts chapter 1. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. He steps aside and empowers them. 
That's his delight. In seeing you, be you an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, shepherd, or teacher. I'm going to run through those in a minute. He loves to see you receive the gifts that he is destined for you and receive the Holy Spirit so that you grow up in those gifts and use them for the heaven earth mission. But I have a question for you now. A few simple questions. I'm going to step aside, lay out, and uh, listen to the comments. Simply, do you see yourself as a masterpiece? If you'd like to comment, go for it. Do you see yourself as God's accomplishment? Like a woodworker. I saw a friend on here who's a, who's a woodworker, friends. You know who you are out there. Um, just like my friend works so carefully on some of the masterpieces I've seen him create. Do you believe that you are a masterpiece creation? Not always. Kathy says a work in progress. Joanna says I do. If you don't, that's okay. No, if you were to comment that, nobody's going to judge you, which is to say nobody judged somebody who says that. Why not? Thanks for saying that, Delith. I don't see myself that way, but would love to move in that direction. When Jesus comes up out of the waters of baptism, John the Baptist is like, I don't need to baptize you, you need to baptize me. Of course, he says, I do, but not always sometimes. It's hard to see it. Jesus says, I've got to do this to fulfill all righteousness. He's showing us how to be human, how to be reborn. Working toward it, Sue says. He's teaching us. And when he comes up out of the water, the, the voice of God says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I'm a fixer-upper. I love that, Doug. God's project. <laughs> yes. God, he's so proud of you, all of you. And some of you don't believe that perhaps because of trauma in your past, you feel unworthy. Some of you are maybe the manly men. I don't need that. This is all touchy-feely stuff. I don't need that. Man, I've met so many manly men who need to know this. Hustling for their worth, trying to show everybody how strong and able and capable they are. There's no strength like a person finds in Christ. Second question for you. Ooh, this one's tougher. Do you see others around you as masterpieces in Christ Jesus? I'm talking to everybody. the second value of our church, of Heaven Earth Church. Someone once said, like, the mission is, uh, a mission of an organization is, like, why you exist, and, and the vision is what it looks like if you fulfill your mission. The values are the parameters within which you're willing to travel. Value one for us is we want to meet people where they are, physically, emotionally, spiritually. We don't want to expect people to come onto our turf and our zone. We want to meet them where they are. Value two is we want to see everybody as God's masterpiece, God's accomplishment. I've shared before, the original language is poema. It's like everybody is God's poetry. Are you seeing others as God's masterpiece? What do you struggle with with that?
That's difficult too, Delise says. I struggle when people have hurt me, absolutely. Mm hmm. Yeah. There's a whole other message about what um, what forgiveness really looks like, you know? Sometimes the church has kept people, like, done these teachings that keep people in harmful situations. We, we sure, certainly uh, shouldn't, shouldn't do that, but no, we're not supposed to judge, Sue. I, I hope that that values where we, uh, it, where it moves us, is that it, it, it leads us to assume the best of God about everybody. Um, ultimately this, um, and the last question is, do you, do you delight in seeing others grow and mature? Our world builds us up to be competition junkies. Our culture may not be an honor and shame culture just like Jesus is, but boy, there's a lot of it in, in our culture. God delights when we are grounded in our true identity in God, and we delight in collaboration rather than competition. Um, it goes back to last week. We can be in the game of overestimating ourselves, which is my sin of choice a lot of times. But then I'll go to the other direction because I'll feel bad about overestimating myself and I'll start underestimating myself, like falling back, self-pity, all kinds of stuff. I'm sure all of you can do that too. You, you're, you're either in the habit of like your, your ego gets really big or you, you're like, oh, I, I don't, I don't, it's not about me. It's not about me. Well, it is about you, but it's also about the person next to you. And all of us in a relationship with Christ as the head and all of us in the body. All right. So, hey, in closing today, here's I want to give you some practical stuff right before we go here. Um, one, a practical exercise is uh, we're going to work with I'll put this up on Facebook later. I want you to, it's going to be super hokey. Warning. Very hokey. I want you to be a pest. Be a pest. Two ways I mean that. Number one, um, instead of an, that annoying, you know, like in the summer when you're like having a good time and then there's an annoying gnat in your ear that's like buzzing and you're waving it off. Well, I want you to be like that around people. I'm going to try to do it too. Um, when people are, you're sensing people are feeling shame or unworthy, walk alongside them. And in your actions first, and maybe also in your words, be like a gnat whispering in their ears. Do you know you're a masterpiece? Be annoying about it in a good way. Um, if you sense that other that people their their ego's a little big, getting up there. Be a be a pest. Be a gnat, like walking alongside them. Help them to feel more secure, because it's probably coming from a place of insecurity. Show them with words and actions that, hey, they are a masterpiece, but the other people around them are too. Their story is not the only story that matters. We have a collective story in God. Lastly, um, I'm going to have you do some homework. Yes. Yes. I would love to know. Do you think of yourself? Do you think God has gifted you as an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, a shepherd, or a teacher? Are you an apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher? You might have just said, Ross, I don't know what those things are. Well, I'm getting ready to tell you. Some folks on our team have done that already. There's actually a, 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 a test out there where you can answer some questions. Um, 
Are you an apostle, prophet? If you want to email me and tell me which one you think you are, do it. This is a way of keeping you from trying to say, I wish I could be like that person. Maybe you're not like that person. In fact, you are not. You ready? Here we go. Really quickly to close for the day. Some practical stuff. Are you an apostle? Paul says it. In Ephesians 4.11, it was he who gave some Christ to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Those are different, like, meta gifts, I guess I would say, in the body. Are you an apostle? These people feel sent out to a mission, a mission field to a disconnected people. I wrote these things down, so I'm going to, like, kind of read them. They are the explorers, the discoverers, the visionaries. They're the pioneers. They believe Jesus is alive in places where maybe others can't see it or believe it. They feel called to a people or place to start something new of Jesus or wake something up of Jesus. Bible examples include Ruth, Mary Magdalene, Paul, or Peter. They feel sent out. Apostles. Are you a prophet? These are folks who get us to look back up to God in the midst of a world that is broken and unjust. They call us to turn and realign our hearts and lives with God's heart and wishes. They're the voices for the oppressed. They have hearts for the broken. They feel a need to speak up when a wrong or injustice is, is happening. Uh, so the Old Testament prophets are Bible examples, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Amos, Amos or Deborah, John the Baptist, James, the letter of James. Are you a prophet? Are you an evangelist? These people bring people around a good cause. Don't think person on the street corner with a sign and a megaphone. That's not an evangelist. That's something else. These people bring people around a good cause, a good experience, or the good news of Jesus. They're the gatherers, the connectors, the inviters. They get excited about good things and have the heart to share those good things with others. They want other people to know the goodness of Jesus' good news, and they do so by listening, being on the lookout, building relationships, making the most of relationships, and sharing their stories. Bible examples include the Samaritan woman in John 4, Philip in Acts chapter 8. Are you an evangelist? Are you a shepherd? Number four, we have two left. These people get in the valley or the pit with hurting people. They provide shelter in the storm. They're the caregivers, the wounded healers, the fierce protectors, the companions. They feel called to help people find rest, comfort, and healing in Christ. Some examples from the Bible include Ruth again or the Good Samaritan from Luke. Finally, are you a teacher? These people dig down into the mysteries and secrets of life to unearth treasures to show others. They're miners for wisdom. They're the searchers, the questioners, the communicators, the show and tellers. When it comes to the mysteries of God's kingdom and the good news of Jesus, they want people to know the life-giving stories, the rich wisdom, and the best things of God. Lots of teachers in the Bible. Are you a teacher? Now, a note on that. Uh, these gifts can show up in surprising and unexpected ways. There are also kind of false presentations of these gifts. Think of the Facebook prophet. The person trying to change the world from behind the screen. Sometimes we can give like a false presentation of these gifts. We're not to judge about that, but it's to listen to ourselves about what's driving this. Is it insecurity or is it security in my identity as a beloved son or daughter of God? You may say, I have none of those gifts, Ross. None of those is me. Maybe you just don't know yet. You don't know yet which one it is, but it's there. And we would love, we would delight, I delight in seeing you grow up in it.